Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab. And today we are honored to have Dr. Donald Abrams with us. He is a leader of uh, in integrative oncology. We've had several conversations about integrative oncology um, or complementary therapies or alternative therapies um, from uh, Bapcha, who basically said so much of this is a scam, to someone like Nisha Winters, who said, this is all good stuff you should be considering. Um, and there's, I call it the gray zone in between these two extremes of, yeah. of how do you evaluate yeah. a treatment? Um, mute. Um, how do you evaluate treatments in a, in a gray zone where it's not kind of clear that it's evidence-based and solid, or it's not, um, you know, obviously something that's probably a, a pretty shaky and you should be skeptical of. Um, so I expect that uh, Dr. Abrams will speak to that that kind of that zone and the decision making process people need to go through. Um, just for the typical housekeeping, we have two disclaimers that we always say up front. One is that um, this is not uh, medical advice. This is information for you to take to your medical team. Um, so we encourage you to uh, learn things and then review it with your medical team. And the second is that uh, this will be made public. Everything you say will be made public. So if you're concerned about that, change your name, hide your video image, and don't say anything. Um, and then also we are a patient-led community. And so I always like to put a plug in that um, if you're inspired to donate, we check out our website and click the donate button. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Abrams. We're, we're, we're very happy he's taking the time to have a conversation with us today. Thank you, Brad. It's a good to be here and nice to see everybody. So I am Donald and I was uh, uh, Chief of Oncology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General for 15 years. I stepped down eight years ago. I've been an oncologist now for 41 years. And at the beginning of my training to be an oncologist, suddenly AIDS came out of the blue. And we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. And it impacted my community. So I was very much uh, involved in the early days of HIV AIDS. And I became a champion at, the, at that time of alternative therapies, even though there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got conventional therapy, I think some of you may remember AZT, I said, oh, this isn't, isn't very good. So I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks on complementary and alternative therapies in HIV. And then in 1992, someone challenged me to study cannabis as a treatment for the AIDS wasting syndrome. And I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. So I fought the government for five years and ultimately won and got marijuana and money to do research, which gave me a strong appreciation of the power of plants as medicine, which then took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, a month after I had done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil, the guru of integrative medicine. And he described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So I said, uh-huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. So I did, and it changed my life. When I finished, I said, I'm done with HIV AIDS. I've done that for 25 years. It's very different from what I started. What I wanna do now is integrative oncology, working with people living with and beyond cancer and helping them to integrate these other modalities, nutrition, physical activity, supplements, including cannabis, Chinese medicine, stress reduction, and spirituality into their conventional care. Can't really do that at San Francisco General, whereas I often say, for most of my patients there, cancer is really the least of their problems. They're homeless, they're addicted, they're psychotic, or they're undocumented. So I can't really talk to them about eating organic or doing yoga. So I went over to our Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, now Osher Center for Integrative Health at the University of California, San Francisco. And I asked if I could just do a half day clinic just to see if I liked it in 2005. And I did, and I liked it, and I did two half days, and then I became the director for a few years, uh, but I stepped down from that, but I continued to work at the Osher Center. And I actually retired from UCSF in 2020, 
in the middle of the pandemic, my retirement party was all online instead of on top of the new hospital building. Uh, but at UCSF, they allow you to retire and disappear for a month, and then you could be recalled emeritus status. So I was recalled and I continued to work at the Osher Center. Uh, initially, I was seeing patients three mornings a week, and now I'm down to two mornings a week, but it's something I really love. I'm very much defined by what I do, and I help people, so I want to continue to do it. So I have, uh, in addition to uh, sort of increase my ability to reach more people, in addition to doing a clinic, I also do group medical visits, where I see up to 10 people uh, for three sessions. The first session is about nutrition and cancer because that is my passion. The second session is on supplements, including cannabis, and increasingly uh, psilocybin is questioned. And the third visit is about physical activity, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, stress reduction, uh, et cetera. And uh, after those three group visits, I often will see patients one-on-one -on -one when I can. Right now, my next follow-up appointment is in March of 2025. So I'm a little bit booked. And uh, I think what I do is, it's not alternative, as Alan was saying, or, or complementary, it's integrative, where we integrate complementary therapies with conventional cancer care. And the question about evidence is critical, because we say in integrative medicine that it's evidence-informed Modern Western medicine is so evidence-based. And as an oncologist, you know, I, I deal when I, was when I was treating cancer at San Francisco General, you know, I deal with a, a very serious disease and we use very significant interventions. So yes, I wanna see results from randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. But if I tell you to eat more blueberries and broccoli, you know, you can't do a randomized placebo-controlled trial where this half of the room eats tofu for the next 25 years and this half eats placebo. I mean, many people think tofu is placebo. So, you know, we can't do those trials in nutrition, which I think is so important. JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, looks at the state of U.S. health. And the number one cause of both morbidity and mortality in the United States today is dietary issues which have surpassed tobacco and hypertension as the leading cause of both mortality and morbidity. And those dietary issues, we don't have randomized placebo controlled trials uh, to support those. Even cannabis, let's talk about that for a minute. It's an effective therapeutic botanical that's been around for thousands of years. And because of our restrictions, making it schedule one, i.e. high potential for abuse, and no accepted medical use, it's impossible to generate randomized placebo-controlled trials showing benefit. So when I see a patient at the Osher Center, I tell them cancer is like a weed and other people are taking care of your weed and it's my job to work with the garden and make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. So I do that to look to see how you're fertilizing the garden. That is what you eat and what supplements you take. And then I go into my spiel that I think the diet should be organic, plant-based, antioxidant-rich, anti-inflammatory, real and whole foods. And then I dive deeper into the fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, et cetera, and talk about meat and fish and chicken and eggs, and uh, then move on uh, to review the list of medications and supplements that are in the patient's electronic medical record. And so often when I see a patient and I go through their list of pharmaceuticals, I say, oh, you don't take any supplements or vitamins? And they say, oh yeah, I do. And then they, they generate a list of 13 other things that the, the physician hasn't listed on their chart. I mean, I know myself because I went for my annual follow-up and they sent me my list of medications and supplements. And I was talking to my doctor uh, when I got there and I said, well, there's some things that we need to change. And then I started listing my supplements and he was at the computer. And he said, let's just keep it simple. <laughs> so they don't want to know that. But I think it's important that, uh, that we do share that information uh, because sometimes there are potential interactions. And that's 
when patients come to me with their shopping bag full of supplements that have been recommended by their next door neighbor and the, their mother's sister-in-law, et cetera, and ask, can I take this? This is an important question because the, the issues are, will there be any interaction with the pharmaceuticals that they're currently taking or will there be an oxidant antioxidant interaction because as you know radiation therapy and much chemotherapy works by creating those free radicals of oxygen to knock in to the tumor dna and smash it and if you're taking antioxidants they're going to take those uh, free radicals out of circulation so they don't do the damage that they're intended to do so so that's important and and i review that with patients but again uh, a lot of that is not based on evidence from randomized controlled trials where patients taking oxaliplatinum are, are randomized to take the saw palmetto or not, because, you know, we just haven't done all that research. So you have to sort of be evidence informed. Increasing evidence is coming now from the Society for Integrative Oncology, founded about 25 years ago, uh, collaborating with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, the major umbrella institution for all oncologists. And the Society for Integrative Oncology and ASCO are creating guidelines. I was recently on a committee that was not a, a collaborative, but it was an ASCO committee that created a new guideline on cannabis and cancer care. But the SIO and uh, ASCO have collaborated on guidelines for treatment of fatigue, uh, anxiety and depression, uh, and more guideline collaborations are, <clears throat> are in preparation or in development. And these guidelines work by reviewing the published literature and deciding if they can make a recommendation and then telling you the strength of the recommendation. So for example, yoga for fatigue uh, there were a number of articles. They determine if the articles are high quality or low quality, and then they determine the strength of their recommendation. So I think integrative medicine recommendations are becoming more evidence-based, if you will, as well as evidence-informed. But the goal of my visit when I see a patient is really to give the patient back a sense of control. When you have the diagnosis, when you hear the diagnosis, you have cancer, your locus of control has been ripped from underneath you. And you're now at the mercy of the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, and the even the chemotherapy nurse. And so by giving the patients things that they can do themselves, modifying their diet, increasing their physical activity, rational use of supplements, decreasing stress, that allows the patient to have an increased sense of control. Another goal of integrative medicine is to decrease ongoing inflammation, because we now appreciate that inflammation is the cause of many of the degenerative diseases of aging, dementia, heart disease, and cancer. And when you decrease inflammation, you uninhibit the body's immune system, so it can also take part in the fight against cancer. I'm sure many of you are aware that the new trend in treating cancer is immunotherapy to unleash the patient's own immune system in the fight against cancer and inflammation inhibits that. So decreasing inflammation is a key. And then stress. I used to ask all of my patients to tell me their story, but then we get graded as doctors. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to hear the person's own impression of their story. But my lowest grade was always doctor knew my history. So I don't ask to hear the story anymore. I tell people their story from what I gathered from the chart and ask if it's correct. But when I ask people to tell me their story, many people wove a story as if stress caused their cancer. Stress in and of itself is not going to cause cancer. But stress is adrenaline or epinephrine, which kills your lymphocytes, the building block cells of the immune system. And stress is cortisol a steroid hormone, which is an immune suppressant. So decreasing stress is critical for people living with and beyond cancer and for all of us in today's crazy mixed up world. So with all those goals, what happens is that I increase a person's sense of hope. I just last week saw a new patient who said, Dr. Abrams, you've really given me some hope. 
And it's not like I, I say, you don't have cancer, or you're not going to die. It's, you know, giving people things that they themselves can do is very empowering. And there are many things that people can do to be active in their treatment. So with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to answer questions. If folks could use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you <clears throat> as uh, questions come up. Um, I'll get us started. Um, Dr. Abrams, one, when I was, I, I have lymphoma, when I was diagnosed, uh, uh, I, I asked about nutrition and they gave me, I was being treated at Dana-Farber, talked to some nutritionists at Brigham and Women's, and they gave me information that was the same information you would get if you wanted to have a healthy brain or a healthy heart. It was just general uh, advice, which being a native Californian, I just naturally follow. These are all healthy things that you should do. And I adopted them over the years and followed those. So it really gave me no information. What I wanted to hear was you have lymphoma, you're getting chemotherapy. Here are the complementary supplements or treatments or things you should really emphasize to increase the effect of that chemotherapy. And currently I'm being treated with an immunotherapy. Same question. Uh, what would be the things that would boost my immune system that would increase or uh, make more effective that immunotherapy? So that's, it's, I guess you would call it more complementary question, but just sort of curious how you think about that. Again, that sort of middle zone where uh, things are useful, selectively personalized, I guess, rather than sort of generically true for good health. Yeah, I think that's a, an issue there because we don't have the data to answer those questions. I mean, more and more evidence is suggesting that people who have taken, for example, a probiotic don't do as well with immunotherapy. Or in Israel, they have a number of uh, observational studies that show that people who use cannabis while they're getting immunotherapy have much worse survival outcomes than people who don't use cannabis. But these are observational retrospective or maybe prospective studies, but they're not randomized placebo controlled. And I just feel that the question of reverse causation, are the people using cannabis because they have a worse prognosis and not the cannabis is making their immunotherapy less effective? So the answer to your question is that there isn't really, no, nobody can tell you what, you know, is going to, what foods to eat to help with lymphoma. I, I, I say that you know, the, what we're doing is making your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. And so your fertilizer should be organic, plant-based, antioxidant-rich, anti-inflammatory, real and whole foods. I'm not a big fan of juicing. Juicing is sugar. I, I follow the American Institute for Cancer Research World Cancer Research Fund guidelines. Number one is to be, and these are guidelines for reducing the risk of cancer, but number 10 says for cancer survivors, follow the nine guidelines above. And number one is to be a healthy weight. We believe that 40% of all cancer now is related to overweight or obesity. Number two is to be physically active, which is a way to be a healthy, maintain a healthy weight. And also physical activity decreases the risk of our most common malignancies, breast, colon, and prostate. And physical activity improves survival in patients with those malignancies and even with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Guideline number three is to avoid sugary drinks. And I was at the microphone in Bethesda when they unveiled that as a new guideline in 2007. And I said, there are sugary drinks and there are sugary drinks. You can drink a cola beverage, God forbid, or a fruit punch, which is probably glucose and high fructose corn syrup, or you can squeeze three oranges in the morning. And the response from the podium was energetically, they're all the same. Because if you eat the orange, the fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. But if you squeeze the sugar away from the fiber, it's like drinking a cola. And why is that bad? When the body sees that sugar, it responds with insulin, an insulin-like growth factor, both of which promote inflammation. And the growth factor is a growth factor for cancer cells as well. In Australia, they rank food in the supermarket for the consumer. And they recently dropped fruit juice from five stars to two stars, ranking it below diet cola, which I never would recommend that anybody drink. So juicing, I would tell you, if you have lymphoma, not something I like because cancer loves sugar. And when my oncology colleagues tell me, 
Why do you tell all of our patients that cancer loves sugar? I say, what's a PET scan? We inject people with radio labeled glucose and where does it go? Right to the cancer because cancer needs sugar. It doesn't use oxygen. Guideline number four is a new one and it says avoid processed fast foods is what they said. And I read my colleague Robert Lustig's book, Metabolical. Robert is our pediatric endocrinologist who fights the war on childhood obesity and sugar. And in Metabolical, he blames our deterioration of the health of the nation over the last 50 years to increase consumption of processed and ultra-processed foods. So I say eat something that you recognize as a real food. And there is evidence that people who consume ultra-processed foods are at greater risk for many cancers. The positive guideline is to eat more of, a, of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and legumes. And in the fruits and vegetables, I favor cruciferous vegetables, those that grow in the shape of a cross, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, collard greens, bok choy, and arugula, seasoned with ginger, garlic, onions, and turmeric. Your fruit should be heavily pigmented, so the berries are all good for you. For animal products, I like deep cold water fish, salmon, black cod, albacore, tuna, herring, mackerel, and sardines. Chicken and eggs are pretty inflammatory. Poultry, which I eat, should be organic oh, uh, poultry. Eggs, which I don't eat, should be organic omega-3. Eggs are second only to processed foods as far as increasing mortality. And eggs are associated with prostate cancer. Two other uh, heavily pigmented fruits for prostate cancer that I recommend are pomegranate and tomato. The lycopene in the tomato needs to be oil extracted though to be bioavailable. Uh, yeah, so that's food. <clears throat> and uh, those are the guidelines there for, oh, alcohol. Yeah, so we now believe that 6% of all cancers related to alcohol and the leading cause of death from alcohol in people over uh, the age of uh, 50 is now cancer. So the guideline used to be a little bit equivocal about alcohol, but now it says for cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. So again, I don't have a specific recommendation for lymphoma or lymphoma and immunotherapy. Uh, I'm a big fan of medicinal mushrooms as a supplement, but the way the mushroom works the cell wall of the mushroom resembles the cell wall of a bacterium. And when you ingest these non-edible medicinal mushroom capsules, your body thinks you're being invaded by a bacteria and mounts a non-specific immune response to fight the bacteria that we also hope will fight cancer. So I do not recommend medicinal mushrooms to patients with lymphoma because I believe the immune system is already turned on too much. And I don't recommend medicinal mushrooms to patients on immunotherapy because I don't want the immune enhancement of the mushroom to interfere with the immune enhancement of the immunotherapy, which is potentially much more therapeutic. These are both totally Donald Gestalt's, not based in any data whatsoever because nobody's done these studies. But in talking to my colleagues around the country who are also integrative cancer care providers, they agree and have adopted the same sort of guidelines. So, you know, sometimes common sense uh, isn't so bad. Okay, um, thank you for all that. Um, uh, Roger Royce, your your hands up. Roger is a pancreatic cancer survivor. Okay, thanks, and thank you for that presentation. I, I have so many things I'd like to talk about, but I'll just drill down on a couple. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, like everything you're talking about, you go to the oncologist and the doctors, and like they've just what should I eat? Doesn't matter. You Doesn't know. really matter. I know. You know. What about supplements? Doesn't matter. Won't help. What about exercise? Eh, if you want, you know, all this stuff. And there's not much that we can do as patients. I can't prescribe myself drugs, but I can change my diet. I can change my exercise. I can figure out my supplements. So this is super helpful. But let me just ask you about one thing that you touched on. And that's, um, I guess, the idea of ROS, you know, uh, with the chemo. And I talked to um, Chinese herbalists. I talked to everybody when I was diagnosed. And one of the consistent things I heard was don't take vitamins and supplements when you're on chemo because it might fight the chemo for all the reasons that, that you mentioned. Um, but I was really deficient 
and vitamin D, vitamin B, selenium, magnesium, all that stuff. Um, so I've, I've kind of gotten that back. But lately, there's this idea that one of the benefits of exercise is that it, it results in mitophagy. In other words, it really stresses your cells and it cleans out you know, uh, some of the, you know, some, some of the bad mitochondria or damaged mitochondria. And that if you take, some, and I heard this on Rhonda Patrick two weeks ago, she mm -hmm. said, there's a theory that if you're taking vitamins and supplements, it's working against the stress that you're getting from the exercise. And I'm just wondering if you have an opinion on that, because that's kind of a radical thought to me. I think that's a radical thought. So a few things, first of all, I am not going to, uh, you know, malign my oncology colleagues for saying it doesn't really matter, although it does frustrate me. But, you know, most oncologists now are an organ specific, you know, GI, GU, breast. And so, and if you look at oncology, I mean, I did retire four years ago, so I'm not trying to keep up as much as I used to, but the advances in the field and the number of new drugs and the names of those new drugs are so astounding that I can't really fault them for not keeping up with integrative oncology and knowing that it does matter what you eat and that you can take supplements during uh, chemotherapy. I mean, a vitamin D is the only blood test I order in patients that I see at the Osher Center. Low vitamin D puts people at greater risk for cancer and people with cancer whose vitamin D levels are low don't do as well as people whose vitamin D levels are normal. So you certainly should have taken vitamin D while you were getting your chemotherapy, and there's no risk to vitamin B12 either. When I talk to patients about supplements during chemotherapy, I'm trying to figure out what the goal of treatment is. If the goal is cure, or if the chemotherapy is given in an adjuvant setting, that is after a surgical intervention, and there's no evidence of disease, then I don't want to do anything that could potentially decrease the risk of cure or interfere with the chemo. If the goal of chemotherapy is only palliative, we're not gonna cure this cancer, and the patient feels like they wanna have some control and they wanna take their supplements, I'm going to allow it. However, if the radiation therapy and some chemotherapeutic agents, as I mentioned, work by creating those free radicals of oxygen, and if people are on those, I'm gonna say, well, maybe avoid some of your stronger antioxidant supplements, like vitamin C, vitamin E, coenzyme Q10, et cetera, while you're getting uh, the chemo. Uh, with regards to stress and exercise stress, and if, key, if supplements are going to, you know, Im impair that, it's that's out of my wheelhouse, but I, I think you're correct in thinking that that's a bit radical. Uh, you know, everybody's got to have an opinion and write a paper on something. So that's probably where that came from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian McCluskey is up next. Uh, thank you. So you mentioned um, that you would avoid taking mushrooms if you're on, if you're doing immunotherapy. Is that, did I get that correct? Yeah, I would do, I, first of all, eating mushrooms is fine. Mm -hmm. All mushrooms must be cooked. Slicing a white button mushroom and throwing in a salad raw is a no. White button mm -hmm. mushrooms have a cancer causing compound in them. Better mm -hmm. mushrooms to eat for immune enhancement are shiitake, maitake, and enoki because mm -hmm. they do have some immune enhancement and perhaps some anti-cancer activity. It's the mushroom capsules that are more concentrated uh, that I would avoid if I were on immunotherapy. Okay. Um, are you familiar with um, the research that uh, Paul Stamets did with uh, respect to uh, Garicon, which is an old growth forest mushroom? And supposedly it does have um, immune enhancing features, particularly with respect to, I think, mRNA vaccines, you know, recently pu published paper on that. And what do you think about that? If, if you're familiar with it? Yeah, well, yeah Paul is a personal friend and, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, he, Agaricon, I think, as you're saying, he thinks is more antiviral than immune enhancing. My favorite, uh, Stamets mushrooms are turkey tail, uh, mm -hmm. which is the one that's been studied the most in Asia. Tremetes versicolor, otherwise known as Coriolis versicolor. Uh, and the, in the books that I've read, and, and others don't agree with this, it takes about four to six weeks uh, taking a mushroom for the immune benefit to be maximal, but then it dissipates because the body becomes used to it. So I ask patients to alternate 
turkey tail with Paul's seven mushroom blend that he humbly named after himself, Stamets yeah. Seven. That yeah, includes, I've seen it. It includes seven different mushrooms, but not turkey tail. So I say, get 60 capsules of that and take two a day uh, for a month and then switch back to the uh, turkey tail. Uh, personally, I stop all of my supplements the last four days of every month just to mm. give my body a chance to clean out and say, yay, they're back again on the first of the month. But yeah, Agaricon, I think, I can't remember. I don't think that that's uh, uh, one of the components of uh, Stamet 7, but I believe it's part of uh, the My Community, which is his 17 mushroom blend, which has such low doses of everything that I consider it to be a good antiviral, but not so good anti-cancer. Got but it. Great. Host, host Defense is my go-to company that I recommend to my patients. For my host Defense. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next up is Jeff Krolik from Portland, Oregon. Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or at least morning here. Um, I had a question about uh, both um, intermittent fasting and eating uh, intervals. Um, uh, my oncologist who practices as a, an integrative oncologist, um, uh, you know, has recommended uh, kind of a regimen of, you know, don't eat between 6 p.m. and uh, 7 a.m. and to fast um, periodically, uh, even including uh, a radiation treatment I had, uh, which uh, for which I had uh, no uh, side effects that I could uh, determine. So um, I hadn't heard you speak uh, uh, really yet about fasting. So I'm wondering how you might uh, you know, view this in terms of uh, integrated oncology. Yeah, I am old school uh, and I cured many patients of cancer who didn't have to fast. Uh, the theory being that if you fast, the cancer cells are more susceptible to the effects of the cancer therapies than the host's normal cells. Well, there's a fasting mimicking diet that's created by uh, Walter Longo from uh, Southern California that's a five day, they send you five days of meals and 800 calories the first day and 400 calories the next four. And they try to do a study in women in the Netherlands with breast cancer. And actually they, it was a phase two, three study, but they couldn't get to phase three because people couldn't tolerate uh, the, that diet. And if you look in the supplement to the publication, the women who did the fasting mimicking diet had more admissions to the hospital with fever and low white blood cells. So it doesn't seem to me that that is protecting the normal cells from the effects of the damaging effects of the chemotherapy. I usually only fast one day a year on Yom Kippur and by the end of the day, I'm cranky and dizzy and feel like I'm going to faint. And I say, why would you want to put people going, getting chemotherapy through this? But, you know, lately when I'm fasting on that day and I felt better. So maybe, maybe there is something to doing a fast day every once in a while. The time restricted eating, which has become very popular. I like the times you said six to 7 a.m. because most of the patients I see who do it don't eat breakfast. And there's increasing data out there that people who skip breakfast are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease and depression. So I think breakfast is probably the most important meal of the day. And if you're gonna do time-restricted eating, I would make sure that you do get to eat breakfast. <clears throat> I've also heard uh, from patients in my group uh, that you know, if they fast, they don't vomit when they get their chemo. Well, I guess that makes some sense, but uh, again, I haven't seen enough data to suggest to me that this is something I need to be recommending to everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up is Jeff. <clears throat> Jeff Markey. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a 14-year uh, survivor of prostate cancer, BRCA2, and uh, I, I just, uh, you, you talk about marijuana for uh, mental um, relief. 
I, I did. Two months ago, I took a 25 milligram tablet, which I'd been doing for a while off and on. And within 15 minutes, I was in AFib. That's the second time that happened. It was a higher dose the last time. But uh, I had to go be cardioverted at the hospital the next day. I just wanted to mention that that, that is a risk. Um, that was after taking abiraterone for two and a half years, which caused a couple of AFib events without marijuana. But it two times put me uh, in AFib within an hour. And it's, it's one thing I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't touch the stuff anymore, uh, but I can't, I can't inhale it because too many years of doing that is just not good. The, um, I found that switching to, to uh, darolutamide, I've now hit seven months of uh, undetectable. And part of it is because uh, I, my diet now consists of a, a huge salad in the middle of the day. Uh, in the morning, I have normally have a, a cereal with low carbs and high protein. And uh, if at dinner, I at the most, I'll have one piece of chicken with a vegetable, broccoli, um, of other kale in the middle of the day. They've really made a difference. Um, what, what, wondering what would you recommend for a breakfast that is high protein, but uh, low carb and uh, good for one to eat? <clears throat> High protein, low carbs, and what? And good for your, uh, you know, your cancer. I obviously that it's helped me a lot that I, my diet is always is quite restricted. And uh, yeah, I, when you say low carbs, I'm a I, I'm a big fan of carbohydrates. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and legumes are all carbohydrates, and that should be sixty percent of what we ingest. So you can do oatmeal, walnuts, and blueberries. Uh, I also like muesli, which is the only unsweetened cereal out there. Uh, it's many different grains and nuts, and I put blueberries and walnuts in that. Uh, another breakfast that I like is uh, broccoli, tofu, and rice. Uh, yep, that, I like a little <laughs> broccoli, tofu, and rice with a, an avocado-based mayonnaise uh, on it. And then what I generally eat for breakfast is uh, mochi, which is just pounded brown rice. I puff it up in the oven, smear almond butter, and put a sweet potato on top of it. That's what I had this morning. So I don't, uh, you know, veer shy of carbohydrates if they're uh, complex carbohydrates and not simple carbohydrates. <clears throat> what about the question about cannabis and side effects? Yeah, so ingesting 25 milligrams orally is definitely going to put you at risk for side effects. I tell patients if they want better control over the onset, the depth, and the duration of the effect, inhalation is better than oral ingestion. When you inhale THC, which is the psychoactive, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, the peak plasma concentration is reached in two and a half minutes and dissipates quite rapidly after that. If you... Uh, ingest it by mouth orally, the peak plasma concentration is reached in two and a half hours. And when you take Delta-9 THC by mouth, when it goes through the liver in the so-called first pass metabolism, uh, the Delta-9 THC gets broken down into an 11-hydroxy metabolite, which is even more psychoactive. So in addition to being at greater risk for cardiovascular effects, which I'm more used to hypotension, hypertension, or tachycardia as opposed to atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, you're more at risk for having an ego dystonic or dysphoric reaction if you orally ingest it. Plus, most of the oral ingested forms are all sugar, gummies, edibles. You took a tablet, I think you said, or a capsule, so that's not <clears throat> putting you at risk for sugar. <clears throat> My favorite Delivery system now for my patients are tinctures, because if you put a liquid under your tongue, <clears throat> you immediately absorb some sublingually, which reproduces the kinetics of inhalation. 
and then you swallow the rest, which uh, reproduces the kinetics of oral ingestion. So I usually recommend tinctures. And by the way, for mochi, this is what I, I don't know if you can, I can't get it. So, but Eden Foods, it's hard to find in a market, but Eden Foods <clears throat> is where I get mochi from. And it's just pounded brown rice and water. And it's not the sweet mochi that people do for dessert. Does it need to be cooked? Yeah, you bake it for uh, 13 minutes at 450. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, um, Dr. Abrams has given us a number of, uh, you know, recommendations, and we'll have a transcript and a recording and notes from this so that uh, people can find all those specific, if you're taking notes, you'll have a, a source <laughs> for those notes. Um, uh, Alan Morris is up next. I'm sorry, I had to find my audio. I'm so bad at this. Hi, Dr. Abrams. Uh, thank you for giving us this learning session. Um, so I live in the world of evidence-based medicine, and it's a pyramid that you're well aware of. And the lowest level of evidence is uh, bench studies uh, and, uh, and an expert opinion. And of course, you are an expert, so your expert opinion is that lowest level of evidence within the confines of um, evidence-based medicine. It turns out that obviously, to, at least to me, and I'm sure to you, that a panel of experts such as yourself would be a level of evidence slightly, not slightly higher, higher than just an isolated person such as you saying something. I suspect this world cancer, and I'd love you to, to give us the, um, the uh, reference for the world cancer. They, I, I suppose, are a panel of people like you who got together and came up with nine recommendations. Oh. Um, I guess what, what I'm asking is, are your societies mature enough, society of, I don't know what you call it, society of uh, integrative uh, medicine, are, you, are your societies mature enough that they have impaneled experts to make, um, and you called it evidence-informed, not evidence-based, evidence-informed recommendations? I guess that's one of my questions. I do have like two or three, but I guess that one's compound enough um, because, people, you know, I fear uh, like uh, other people fear that uh, there's an avalanche of snake oil salesman stuff out there and people are reaching for stuff. They want people like you that have the moniker of a world renowned institution like UCSF to literally lay out recommendations and probably not just recommendations from you personally, from you re reading bench research and your own isolated opinion, but hey, do we have a consensus from, well, the NCCN and panels 20 to 24 people, do we have a consensus from what we have vetted our experts in uh, integrative medicine? Uh, do we have a panel? Uh, I, that's too compound of a question right there, but I'll let you talk. Yeah, so the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund, is a continuous update project. They publish a 700 page booklet every 10 years. And they definitely have a panel of experts from all over the world, greater than 24 people. In, in, in integrative medicine? No, this is the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund that makes the 10 recommendations for decreasing the risk of cancer. Uh, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay. yeah okay. This, is, this is confusing. This is confusing because what you're really saying is that's within the world of evidence-based medicine. And you did divide your things into three things, nutritional supplements and physical stress reduction, all that. I I'm gonna tell you, even though we got testimony from a patient, he went in and asked about nutritional, he asked about exercise, and everybody poo-poos them. I'm telling you, in evidence-based medicine, at least the world I live in, everybody, and it's evidence-informed. In other words, it's not a, it's not a randomized control uh, trial study. Everybody says lose weight. Everybody believes in in in. Uh, it, for years, there was pyramid. When I grew up, 45 years ago, there was the food pyramid. That, in a sense, is evidence-informed. In other words, there's experts in that are doctors giving their consensus opinion that nutrition is important. Um, uh, so it, so if there's guidelines that say, hey, eat, eat uh, cruciferous uh, vegetables and all that, that is not outside the realm of uh, mainstream medicine. Um, I guess what I'm speaking to is I think the real crux 
of your the gray zone that you're in is the supplements. And people are weighing in on the supplements that are not evidence-based. My question to you is, do you have an integrative uh, medicine? First off, have you vetted who experts are? And then after you have vetted who the experts are, have you impaneled them as a society into a group of like 2024 to vet, for example, whether mushrooms, uh, if they're heated versus if they're eaten raw versus if they're, you know, I'm making up a, a minutia story that everybody wants to drill down on their favorite minutia supplement. I think there's a there's multiple questions in there. I'll stop now. Yeah, I don't know how to answer most, most of them. The Society for Integrative Oncology was founded by Barry Castleth at Memorial Sloan Kettering about 25 years ago. And as I mentioned, it's uh, 600 members from across the world. And they do do panels with the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I don't think that they've done a panel. Well, they do. They, they did a breast cancer treatment panel. They sort of said that many of the supplements are not beneficial. Right. Supplement. So it's, it, it sounds to me like it's in, you're, you're in, obviously you're in the right direction. You're the expert, but I want to caution everybody. This is in its infancy as far as trying to bridge the gap between evidence informed and evidence based. And in fact, you're, you're testifying that this uh, panel that you're talking about is actually a union of evidence based physicians and integrative me uh, medicine physicians. Uh, doing this recommendation. And I think you said there's 10 recommendations right now from the World Cancer something or other. That's the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund. I yeah. urge you to go look at the site. It's very well referenced. It's international panel of experts that meets continuously. Walter Willett, Harvard's best nutrition scientist, is one of the main uh, which, which, participants in that. And, that and, and, but that is different from the Society for Integrative Oncology. So you're sort of mixing apples and oranges there. Although no, it, many of us in integrative oncology use those guidelines as our, you know, sort of evidence informed slash based uh, basis to which to have conversations with patients about how to, you know, prolong their survival. Yes. Uh, do you direct your patients to this more authoritative, more evidence-based um, site? I send them the handout of the 10 yeah, yeah. recommendations. You, that's on the positive side. On the flip side, on the negative side, do you caution them about all the snake oil salesman stuff out there? Well, yeah. I mean, when patients come to me and say, should I <clears throat> juice everything and do coffee enemas? I say, that's ridiculous. Many of my patients spend $30,000 to go to Tijuana to get things that are totally crazy. But, you know, again, if it's somebody that has metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma, I, my two best friends I lost to pancreatic cancer. And if they feel like this is what they want to do, I advise people go to Tahiti. Don't spend your money and, you know, go to Tahiti and, and scoop, uh, snorkel. Don't spend $30,000 to get coffee enemas and and all sorts of ozone and rectal insufflations of oxygen, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, is Nigel Brockton um, one of the people at the, that, that, that is at the AICR? I'm, I don't know the okay, whole. Because we, we had a pres presentation from him and I think that that's the organization that he's from. Um, Rob Owens next. Uh, Dr. Abrams, um, I'm a, a recent uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma survivor. Uh, during my uh, treatment, I responded extremely well, um, and I basically ate, uh, supplemented, ate well, Mediterranean diet, whatnot, and uh, um, ended my treatment early based on my uh, response to it. And I ended up putting together a, a very lengthy case study that um, is being reviewed at Mayo right now. How often with your patients do you do a retrospective analysis? That's basically how I did with my retrospective analysis of what worked. Right? The combinations of things that I were, was, was doing worked extremely well. Is that done often to try and backtrack to, to, to get a feel for what combinations of supplements and diet work with specific types of cancers um, just 
I'm not sure if that's a, a good question there or if it's something you can answer, but I'm just curious no, no, what kind of data is collected. I think the answer is no, it's not done often. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. But, well, no, no, that's that's fine. I, I was wondering how maybe how often more often it should be done because you know, when I did my respective analysis, literally I was able to piece together how you know zinc and vitamin C and B12 and um, alprazolam. I was saying alprazolam and procorporazine. Um, all of these had played a key role in uh, directly affecting the squamous cell um, from all the research I did on NLM and NIH. Um, uh, so yeah, I was just that was just a question. I, I want to see how often that is done, and I'm sure you've never had a patient in the middle of the, their cancer treatment put together a case study on themselves, uh, you know, um, like I would have, <laughs> like I did myself. Um, so there's no data collected on a lot of these integrative methods that we can reference is do you see value in doing something like that you're breaking up a little i'm not sure i understand what your question is i'm sorry um do you think there would be value in collecting data um from these integrative sources you have to see you know when you add add in supplements and whatnot and, and whatever results you're getting is there value with that I think he said the question is it useful to uh, have a, a very detailed uh, case of an individual patient. Yeah. Um, so my friend, my friend Glenn Saban wrote a book on that, N of One. Uh, I think Alan would agree that that's not the best, uh, most strong evidence of one person's uh, experience. But he managed to write a whole book on how he cured his chronic lymphocytic leukemia with green tea. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a little bit distracting for other people to believe that they can possibly do that. So I'm not sure there's any value in what you're what you're proposing. But actually, Brad, I have another call at uh, 10 o'clock. So hopefully we're going to wrap this up. Yeah, I was going to bring us home in just a few minutes. Um, there's one Brian has his hand raised and then and Dr. Apfel had uh, a couple of comments in the chat. If we could do those two things uh, before. Two minutes. Brian. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Um, Ari, did you have a question? Your your hands kind of going up and going down. I'm not sure. And I wanted to yield the okay. floor to you. No, not, no, not, not urgent. You go ahead, Brian. Okay. All right. So real quick. Um, so one of my doctors quite a while ago, I'll name him Dr. David Agus. You may know him, co-founder of the Larry Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine. Basically, you know, agrees with a lot of things that you've talked about in terms of managing the soil and um, and all that kind of stuff, but was not a proponent of supplements. And his contention was that you, you pee out a lot of the supplements that you, you take in. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts on that because that's been sort of like an overarching mm, uh, message I've had in my head of, you know, it's, it's not really particularly useful to do supplements. Again, the main supplement that I recommend to people is vitamin D. Uh, mm -hmm. So much of the society is vitamin D deficient that the Institute of Medicine actually lowered the lower limit of normal from 30 nanograms per ml to 20, because that encompassed 95% of the U.S. population, so they felt it was normal. And I think mm -hmm. that just made a lot more people deficient. And numerous studies in the medical literature have demonstrated that people with cancer whose vitamin D levels are low have worse outcomes than people whose vitamin D levels are normal. The question that isn't answered is, is, does supplementing vitamin D to get to a normal level, is that the same as having a normal level de novo? And we don't know that, but I'd rather err on the side of caution and bring people's vitamin D levels into a good range. People who take uh, proton pump inhibitors, especially if they're over the age of 50, can become deficient in some nutrients, the most important of which is vitamin B12. So if people are on omeprazole or something like that, I often recommend a B12 supplement. I like coenzyme Q10 for people who are on statins because statins deplete the muscles of coenzyme Q10. I used to be a bigger fan of omega-3 supplementation than I currently am. Studies in men with prostate cancer who are going to have their prostates removed 
uh, at UCLA. One group got a low fat diet with omega-3 supplementation. The other group got the standard American diet with no omega-3. Food was prepared and delivered uh, by UCLA chefs. At the end of six weeks, the prostates were removed. And the men who got the omega-3 supplements had smaller prostates, less cancer, less aggressive cancer, and their plasma inhibited prostate cancer cells in the test tube, whereas the men on the no supplementation didn't. So there is also a suggestion that omega-3s may decrease the risk of a heart disease, uh, myocardial infarction. I'm a big anti-dairy person. I don't think dairy is a good food. So dairy is our major source of calcium. Calcium mm. decreases the risk of uh, colon uh, cancer, may increase the risk of more aggressive prostate cancer. So for men, I'm a little bit you know, risky on how much calcium to recommend. Calcium constipates, magnesium does the opposite. So I often recommend people take a calcium magnesium supplement and zinc is also good for the immune system and for prostate cancer. So if you get a Cal Mag zinc. So I think all of those are fine during chemo, during radiation. And I think there is enough evidence to support that uh, yeah, we need calcium for our bones and magnesium and dairy, as I said, is the major source of calcium. And I ask patients to avoid dairy. So, okay. you know, I those are my uh, supplement recommendation. Then I throw in mushrooms sometimes. And for people who have been treated with chemo, which I consider to be a very potent antibiotic, I often recommend taking a probiotic supplement. And that's it. I don't, patients come to me with quercetin, resveratrol, you know, all uh, honokio, artemisinin. I say that's all snake oil. Forget it. Save your money. Go to Tahiti. Vitam vitamin C, fit in that. Vitamin C orally. The, when I did a, a course at the National Cancer Institute, I learned that the maximum amount that we can uh, absorb from an oral dose is 240 milligrams. So my right. patient's taking a gram, two grams, three grams. I say, uh-uh, you're peeing that all out. Yeah. Take it in divided doses if you want to take that much. Vitamin C intravenously, in my opinion, stay away. Save your money. Yeah. Go to Tahiti. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Brad, you want to bring it home? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Abrams. We'll let you go. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.